Hello, I'm Rich Whitehouse, and uh, if you're watching this, you probably already are aware of the fact that I wrote an Atari Jaguar emulator for the recent uh, Atari 50-year celebration release. And in a couple of days here, I am planning on actually releasing that emulator in a standalone build, which I'm sure will be, you know, uh, great news for a lot of you to hear. Uh, <laughs> I've been getting the occasional question of, you know, are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? And I've been saying, you know, uh, just just give me a little time here and I'll make an announcement. So here's the announcement. Um, but anyway, before I do the actual release, I figured I would make a little video and uh, go through some of the features of the emulator, stuff like that. Um, because I actually have put a pretty substantial amount of effort into this standalone release. Uh, lots of interesting features. Um, you know, the whole framework is done from scratch. And um, I think there's some stuff in here that people will enjoy. It's also got some really uh, just terrible, horrible secrets that I, I don't think anybody will ever discover, but I, I would be very pleased if they did. And so uh, here we go. Uh, Obviously, the version number at the bottom there is, uh, you know, local placeholder that gets automatically patched in as part of my build process. Um, you know, I've already got all the automation here figured out. This isn't my first project, so... <laughs> uh, anyway, so, you know, start the emulator up. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are already bitching about that intro screen, it can be skipped, and you can load directly into a cartridge or, you know, a, a game image or whatever. So, there you go. Um, but anyway, normally you start the emulator up and you're greeted with the low cartridge screen. Um, we'll get to that in a moment. But before we do that, let's go through some of the wonderful settings. And of course you'll notice that as we go through the menu here, uh, you'll be given actual descriptions of what all these options do. So you can get pretty in-depth with customizing this thing. And um, I've changed some of the de defaults here already to my personal preferences. Um, as you'll note, I have uh, the blitter is free instead of actually taking cycles because this allows a lot of games to run way faster. And while it does break some stuff, um, which is why the default is you know trying to be kind of close to hardware, um, uh, most games feel way better. <laughs> uh, Tempest 2000 in particular, you know, you generally get to run at 60 hertz if you're not waiting on the blitter. Um, another option for making games faster is just to disable pipeline emulation. Um, obviously that can result in stability issues and other problems as well, but uh, that's the second one I'll usually go to before I resort to actually, you know, overclocking the CPUs. Um, but anyway, yeah, we have a whole lot of different options, uh, compatibility tweaks, um, and generally um, you know, I expect most people won't be using most of these options, but they are pretty handy for customizing the experience, and, um, they do allow you, you know, for the first time to actually play a lot of Jaguar games at 60 hertz, uh, especially because, um, I think this is the first, uh, emulator that offers options like these while having, you know, really good accuracy and compatibility and all that, um, being able to actually run all of the retail cartridge games without any issue. Um, so anyway, I uh, got plenty of video options, multi-monitor support, of course. Um, HDR output uh, is not something you see commonly supported in emulators, and the main reason this is here is for the screen effects. And the screen effects allow you to, you know, do anything you want with, um, you know, the output image of the game, basically. Um, the system is uh, very much like what you see in RetroArch, if you're familiar with uh, what they have going there. You can do multiple passes, you can assign um, vertex and fragment programs to each pass. Um, it does support um, any, any graphics API that you could imagine, but in practicality you probably only need to care about uh, GLSL as your uh, shading language input here because I don't think I will be porting this emulator to anything that doesn't support OpenGL. Like uh, Mac OS and Linux are currently on the agenda, but um, you know I don't see any need to have like a direct 3D rendering backend. That would just be silly, because <laughs> I'm not gonna be putting the standalone build on the Xbox, even though obviously 
Um, the emulator core is already running on the Xbox through the Atari uh, Celebration release. But anyway, um, if you do go with the HDR output option, you, know, you have a couple of options for changing the base gamma and the color scale. Um, you might find that this is appropriate to do depending on the actual capabilities of your HDR display um, and where you basically, you know, find the greatest benefits in terms of color range and, you know, vibrancy or whatever. Um, but yeah, totally up to you. It, com it comes with reasonable defaults as well that should be, um, well, I won't say compatible, but should look okay on, <laughs> on pretty much any HDR display because HDR standards are still all over the place, um, especially where actual, you know, luminance is concerned, the, the appearance of luminance, I should say. Um, and you do have some options as well because, you know, you might be dealing with some screen effects that are not, um, were not written for HDR output, so you can force the entire post chain to output to HDR buffers and uh, obviously preserve that HDR data all the way into the uh, actual HDR back buffer when you're using an HDR display. Um, and the program comes stocked with a pretty reasonable number of uh, screen effects here. But there, there is also going to be a standalone release which allows you to automatically convert um, any, any RetroArch um, shader preset, basically. So you can point this uh, program at a shader data set meant for RetroArch. It will automatically convert it to my own uh, post-processing stack system, automatically convert the shaders and everything. And uh, I've tested it with a pretty good range of stuff and it does work with the uh, RetroArch Mega Bezel shader, which is pretty great. Um, so, you know, that, that's a nice option um, considering that this is a totally standalone binary. Um, which I'm sure will uh, ruffle some feathers, but <laughs> it is what it is. So, but uh, anyway, these are options which uh, allow you to adjust the visible region um, of the actual Jaguar, depending on whether you're NTSC or PAL. Um, so coming back out here, I got some. Aren't too many audio options, but you know you do have some. And uh, input options are quite extensive. <laughs> so you'll notice that uh, we have this overlay thing. I'll talk about that in a bit once we actually start a game up. Uh, Xbox controller hack, of course, because uh, Microsoft is terrible at writing drivers. And let's see here. So all, all of the various systems um, do have, you know, everything. Uh, is kind of oriented around this plugin architecture, but of course the emulator itself will only come with um, one stock plugin per uh, category here because really there's uh, not much reason for me to go writing arbitrary backends when I'm only targeting Windows initially. Um, and uh, you know, like the OpenGL video plugin will be shared across the various ports uh, because, like I said, OpenGL is supported by everything I plan to target. Uh, audio will obviously change, input will change uh, for Linux and Mac OS, but um, anyway, so you ha you can select up to eight devices, so the uh, Jaguar Team Tap emulation is supported, and when you go into the device t selection, you can select the type, so rotary controllers, uh, as you might be familiar with, uh, kind of a hidden feature in Tempest 2000, uh, standard analog controllers, um, through bank switching driving controller, which I don't know which games use this. I know that um, Club Drive actually supports it. I don't know if the, the hardware associated was ever actually released, but <laughs> um, it, it might have been. I haven't actually done the, uh, the historical dig there to find out, but in any case, um, you know, full analog driving support in that game uh, can be accessed through this option. And then you have, um, this is basically uh, analog controller support through um, some hardware that was removed from uh, later Jaguar hardware models. And the only thing I'm aware of that actually uses this is Battlestar, and you have to access it or enable it through a cheat code. So, <laughs> but uh, if you want to play Battlestar with some analog input, there you go. So, 
Um, those are all the uh, input device types currently supported. Um, you know, there, there's some more stuff planned. You can see the website for details on that. And when you go into the set binding screen, uh, you can see you got your nice little Jaguar tail highlighting your current item, current button. And uh, you can go through and, you know, set all the buttons uh, at once like this, or you can go through and uh, adjust each, in, each individual trigger, or you can add or remove, you know, an arbitrary number of triggers. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of control, a lot of flexibility in the inputs, and um, obviously, you know, the default binds um, have it set up so that you can hold the left trigger and uh, push another button, and that kind of helps you map out uh, the entire Jaguar numpad on, um, you know, an Xbox controller, basically, which can be pretty goddamn confusing initially, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it, um, it, it's not so bad once you get used to it. And, of course, you can also do things like uh, map these various um, numpad buttons to, like, a direction on your second analog stick or, you know, all, all kinds of possibilities there, whatever you happen to find uh, easiest to deal with. And then we have these additional options. These are for um, those different devices. So you've got analog input. You've got these extra buttons that are used on some of the bank switching controllers. And then you have um, actual emulator functionality buttons. So you can bind stuff to screenshot, save and load state. Uh, fast forward, which is a nice feature I'll get into shortly. And of course, bringing up the menu and the controller overlay. So, I've been going through all that. Let's uh, take a look here. So, the actual game browser supports MRQ files, uh, which is a format that's used by the game uh, Jag Jaguar game drive, excuse me. And um, that basically gives it all that meta information about developer, publisher, release date, and this very low resolution um, box art here. And as we scroll through, you'll notice Atari Karts here has a much nicer, higher resolution box art image. Um, and so if you want, you can, you know, put a ping file uh, alongside uh, or in place of an MRQ file. And it'll pick that in preference, assuming that uh, the ping resolution is probably, you know, much nicer, much higher. And uh, so Jet, uh, Cybermorph here is one of the games that I've kind of fully decked out. And... Once you're in the game here, you can bring up that uh, controller overlay if you want any help. And so, let's see here. So you can adjust the scale of this thing as you want. And you'll notice that uh, it actually has the Cybermorph inlay. Uh, and you, that's also something you can customize. You can put a, an overlay uh, ping file next to the game, and if it's present, whenever you're uh, in the controller binds menu with the game loaded or you bring up this overlay, it will actually put that uh, inset in there for you, composites at a runtime. And uh, obviously, you know, the, the, um, the layout here is pretty confusing. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's useful as kind of a quick reference. Obviously, I would not keep this up while playing, but um, if you happen to forget, you know, what particular combination of buttons is bound to whatever numpad input or whatever, um, just bring this up, and that's a nice quick reference. And uh, let's see here. So you'll also also notice that Cybermorph is running. Uh, much nicer than it usually does, and that's because I have, uh, as you may recall, the blitter set to free, so it can run. It's it's not very balanced by uh, actual GPU operations or anything like that. So when you when you're saying the blitter is free, it can run pretty damn fast. Um, it does feel quite nice this way, so I like to play this way. Uh, as I was saying, in most games. So, every game in this list, you know, fully compatible. Um, I think Iron Soldier, Iron Soldier is one of the ones that no other emulators managed to run 
correctly yet. And uh, this is one of my one of my more favorite Jaguar games, I'd say. It's got a lot of issues, and of course it was not a Jaguar exclusive, but the uh, the Jaguar version, uh, even on hardware, runs pretty nice and is uh, one of the more technically well accomplished games in the library, I'd say. As far as emulator features go, I think that just about covers it. Um, Fight for Life is one of those games that if you uh, if you have Blitter set to free, it's going to be terrible <laughs> because uh, like like a few other games, uh, it kind of depends on the Blitter taking some time um, to do stuff, and if it doesn't take enough time to do stuff, it'll kind of just like loop around. It doesn't have uh, real nice frame limiting, and it'll just start uh, stomping on data occasionally, stomping over frame buffers, um, stuff that is being uh, blit into, you know, that should still be being blit into, but, you know, if, if we immediately say it's done, then we just run around and blit into it again before we've even had a chance to put it on screen, so you'll see you know, lots of tearing and stuff like that. Um, let's see, what's another nice game to demo here? Uh, Towers 2 is another one that uh, I think it's generally been a mess in emulation so far. Uh, there, there are a couple, I won't say bugs in the game. Um, there, there is one or two, there are one or two what bugs in the game that do cause emulation difficulties, but a big thing um, is that nothing is handled um, interrupts quite properly up until now. And that results in like a whole bunch of uh, screen tearing and stuff like that in this game, if you aren't handling it properly. And as you can see here, everything is running quite swimmingly. I mean, it still runs like ass, but <laughs> it is a Jaguar game after all. Um, yeah. Punched. Um, but, uh, yeah. I think that pretty much covers it. And of course, everybody's favorite, but, uh, you know, th this one is actually one of the um, easier games in the library to emulate. Doesn't tend to have a whole lot of uh, hang ups in terms of timing problems. The blitter use is pretty straightforward. Um, I mean, um, actual computation isn't very demanding. Um, although people people seem to cite it as one of the better looking Jaguar games. Um, you know, I, I guess sure, <laughs> but. Um, This one, I believe, does benefit a little bit um, from disabling pipeline emulation. That'll get it running a bit faster, but it is still uh, naturally, I think, VSync limited. I haven't actually dug into the disassembly for this one and checked out what is uh, capping the frame rate, but I'm guessing it's probably just locked by VSync. So it might, it might be pretty easy to uncap this one as long as they um, do handle variable time steps correctly, and I think they probably do because there are so many instances where this the frame rate in this game uh, falls below the cap, and so they must be at least handling that much. So it's possible it, it's handled in the other direction too, where you're running super fast. Definitely would be uh, worth checking out because this is another one that I think would feel way better if uh, everything were actually ticking along at 60 hertz. And, uh, oh yes, of course, I forgot, you can also record and play back movies. So, uh, first, first emulator I remember ever doing this, I think, was, uh, Nesticle. And, you know, 
obviously I, I took a lot of uh, thematic inspiration from those old bloodlust emulators when I was writing this thing, <laughs> doing the interface and such. And uh, those emulators will always have a special place in my heart because, um, you know, I can't remember how old I was when I first came across Nesticle, but I was pretty young. And it was kind of my first exposure to uh, emulation being not just viable, but actually, you know, being fun, actually creating a playable and excellent experience um, on even my, I think I had a shitty 486 PC at the time. So, um, you know, it, it was kind of natural to pay homage when I was doing the standalone build for this thing. But uh, anyway, so you can record a movie, stop recording, play back the movie, and, uh, you know, you can see progress, and if you want to stop at any point, yep, uh, you can stop and start playing from where you were, which is always a neat feature to have. So it's basically like a, a more elaborate save state. <laughs> and uh, the movies do work 100% just based on input, because emulation is completely deterministic in this emulator, which is uh, a feature, uh, well, I guess you could call it a feature, a feature I'm very proud of, pleased with, you know, because if I had gone the route of doing uh, native parallel processing and not locking things down like very severely to the degree that it would probably negate the performance benefit, um, we would not have the benefits of completely deterministic emulation and we couldn't do stuff like uh, movie playback purely based on uh, user inputs. but. It is deterministic, so we can. And uh, obviously, you know, you got your recent history of standard fair niceties. Um, everything should work in PAL mode. You know, I, I never actually play anything in PAL mode because it typically just feels terrible. <laughs> Somebody who's used to playing things at 60 hertz does not like playing things at 50 hertz, uh, even when they are, you know, adjusted to compensate for that timing difference. Which, of course, many games are not. They just run at 50 hertz, and you know, it's slower. Um, uh, and yeah, the, you know, there. I could go into all these different options and exactly what they do because there, there's a ton of it. But I'll, I'll leave that for uh, you, dear user, to uh, accomplish by exploring and reading. All of those little descriptive texts that I've written, and uh, of course, um, it is you know localizable. So if anybody wants to make some translations for other languages, you are free to do so. Um, but but of course, keep in mind that obviously things are still in development. So I might uh, break your localization with a future update. Something to be aware of. Uh, you can also automatically update the emulator and place here. The infrastructure is already set up for that. As you can see here, it's telling me there's a new version because, uh, you know, the build version is bogus for this, <laughs> for, for this build. And so it's just like, oh, there's a version there. Yep, I'll take it. But uh, anyway, yeah. Um, and so, uh, of course, as some of you may also know, I am uh, presently dying from cancer, and I have a pretty risky surgery coming up on December 6th here. So uh, if this first release of the emulator is the last one, um, you know, I died. <laughs> but, uh, but otherwise, I am planning to uh, do a lot more work on this thing, um, uh, and when the website is up, which it may already be by the time you're, you're watching this, but uh, you can go there and see um, kind of the roadmap of features that I have plans. Um, and uh, there is also a frequently asked questions section, which I'm sure will address many of the questions that you have perhaps already asked yourself or want to ask me uh, in watching this video. So, uh, you know, check check the um, description text on this video, and I'll have a link um, to the website if indeed um, I've actually released this thing by now. So, uh, yeah, there you have it. Uh, wish me luck. Yeah, if you want more uh, Jaguar emulator updates, hope I don't die. <laughs> and uh, 
of course, you know, there, there are Patreon links on the website and such, so if you want to actually fund me in developing this thing further, by all means, uh, please do. Um, you know, the, the logistics are such that the more money I make on Patreon, the longer I can go without having to go off and make a living and support myself with contracts and all that, so maybe one day uh, I will get enough Patreon income and not be dying of cancer, that I can uh, do this stuff a little more full-time. That'd be fun. All right.